I really think the more successful client relationships we've had have started with interviews and conversations that are deeper than than a design idea. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I am your host, Ryan Willard, and today I am honored to speak with James Laposta, who is an FAIA member. He is LEED certified and he is the esteemed principal and chief architectural officer at JCJ Architecture. As CAO, Jim masterfully manages design excellence, ensures top-notch technical service delivery and oversees professional licensing standards. As a pivotal figure in JCJ's executive leadership, Jim champions a design-forward ethos, identifies business ventures aligned with JCJ's foundational principles guarantees unparalleled client experiences and upholds the zenith of ethical and operational benchmarks. Jim's architectural journey is deeply rooted in public and community-centric projects, notably educational infrastructures serving public, independent and tribal nations. Under his guidance, JCJ has earned accolades for crafting schools that echo modern values of innovation, mutual collaboration and avant-garde educational methodologies. A poignant voice in architectural discourse, Jim collaborates with both client bodies and architectural fraternities, spanning local to international arenas. Having helmed the AIA's Committee of Architecture for Education and spearheaded JCJ's partnership with the American Architecture Foundation's Design for Learning initiative, he's an industry trailblazer, constantly revolutionizing school designs that cater to evolving teaching methodologies and student accomplishments. In a recognition of his monumental contributions, especially in educational architecture, Jim was distinguished as a fellow of the American Institute of Architects in 2013. So it was a real privilege to sit down and discuss with Jim his career, the legacy and the multi-generational uh, transitions of JCJ. Um, and we talk a lot about, about that, the history of the firm, um, his career and his pathway to partnership. We also look at how business acquisitions are used by JCJ uh, to become a powerful tool and a long-term strategic method for entering into new sectors. And we discuss the challenges with it and the ways to do it effectively. We also look at the ESOP model of ownership, which JCJ has recently undergone, which was a natural evolution of the firm's culture. And we also talk about the skills and attributes that are needed for a firm partner. So as always, an episode filled with absolute gold. So sit back, relax and enjoy James Laposta. Have you ever had trouble finding an architectural photographer who could really make your project shine? Today's episode is sponsored by renowned architectural photographer Tobin Davies. Tobin Davies eliminates the hassle by traveling to your location to create the stunning photographs your project deserves, and we are happy to support him here on the Business of Architecture podcast. Visit TobinDavies.com or BayawayPhotos.com to book a shoot in less than 10 minutes and ask about the special offer for Business of Architecture podcast listeners. Again, that's TobinDavies.com or BOAPhotos.com. Jim, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? I'm great, Ryan. Thanks. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun to be here. Absolute pleasure to have you on the, on the show. Um, so you are one of the principals at JCJ uh, Architecture. Um, you've been there for a whopping nearly 40 years. Closing in on 40 years. I joined in 1986, yeah. Fantastic. I mean, that's, that's in itself really incredible. And I love speaking to um, partners of businesses that have that depth of knowledge with one single firm because the level of nuance and intricacies and the depth that you know about all the mechanisms of the business is really, really, you know, it's deep. It's very, and it's very, very insightful for actually understanding how a business operates. Um, so your your firm was established in 1936. You've got about 150 employees across seven offices. Um, seems like you guys are pretty much licensed in every state in the U.S. Um, uh, pretty close to it at this point. We have a couple, a couple we're working on. Alaska, not Hawaii. Alaska or Hawaii no. yet. Now on the list. 
Great. So you've got and you've got seven offices, Boston, a whole load on the East Coast, where you are today in, in, in Hartford. Um, and you guys have got an incredible portfolio, a very diverse portfolio of work from adaptive reuse, arts and culture, community buildings, um, K-12 educational facilities. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's an incredibly impressive organization. Um, and I, I think, I guess the, my first question is, you know, with, with a company of such heritage, how did you... How did you first get involved with JCJ? Um, and perhaps you could tell us a little bit about what you knew of the business before you, before you joined. Mm-hmm. I, th- I think like a lot of young architects, I knew pretty much nothing about the business of running an architecture firm when I joined. Um, I, I, I found the firm actually through an alumni network. Um, I was a student at Rensselaer, uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in upstate New York in the master's program uh, for architecture. And uh, Ed Jeter and Dave Jepson, who were um, the two owners of the firm at the time, uh, the firm was called Jeter, Cook & Jepson Architects back in the in the 80s, actually up until 2005 when we went the acronym route. Um, so right. Ed and Dave, I met through, uh, through some alumni events. They were both uh, alumni of the college. Um, we struck up a conversation actually after a hockey game at an alumni <laughs> event. And... Um, and uh, it turned into a summer internship in 1985 uh, in uh, coming down to Connecticut from upstate New York. Um, had a good couple of months. Uh, we stayed in touch while I was finishing my master's degree. And I ended up uh, coming back here to join them. I had, it would seem like a lot of opportunity. They had been um, owners of the firm, I think, at that point for 25 years or so themselves. Right. Uh, Dave, Dave Jepson, who's, whose role I really took over. Um, after he retired a few years back, he um, he had joined the firm after coming out of the Navy, and had, this had been his one career as well. So there's a, a kind of a legacy of people spending spending a lot of time here at the firm and really getting to know know the business and know the practice. So so was the 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 head office was always in Connecticut. The firm was founded in Hartford, and up right. until 2005, that was the only place we had an office. Um, right. Okay. We, we, and then you... we began, yeah, we, we didn't expand and officially till 2005. We started working across the country in the mid 90s, but we didn't establish a second office till the early 2000s. And and what what has it been about JCJ that's had you commit your career to the to the practice? How come you never you, you were never swayed or seduced by another firm? Well, I, I I won't tell you I hadn't looked early in my career. Most people do. <laughs> Um, and I'd also like to tell you there was some grand plan, but there really wasn't. Um, yeah. there was always the next great project to do. And, uh, one of the things we've always done here, and I think I was the beneficiary of it is give young architects opportunity uh, to step up into, you know, into roles, perhaps on bigger projects than they might in other firms. So I was getting tremendous opportunity and trust early on in my career. And that led to significant roles leading the design of, of relatively significant, but also always interesting projects. A lot of uh, K-12 projects in the in the 90s and before that, um, retirement communities, which was a, a major part of our practice in the Northeast back in the late uh, 1980s. Mm-hmm. And that just, uh, the opportunity was there and uh, one project led to the next. And it's always hard to leave when you have a really interesting project going on. How, how has the firm changed in the last 40 years mm-hmm. since your kind of uh, uh, beginnings there? Sure. Well, I mean, obviously we've grown. We, we were, uh, when I began, we were about 30 people in one office in downtown Hartford, Connecticut. Um, we focused primarily on local projects. Uh, most of our work was within the state of Connecticut with a couple of forays into nearby Massachusetts, Rhode Island, upstate New York. And we were focused mostly on community-based projects. So we would do um, churches, schools, uh, retirement communities, a lot of work for not-for-profits. Um, and then in the late 80s, we began to grow. Um, there was a, a period of tremendous growth in Connecticut and Hartford in particular with a lot of mid-rise towers. And we began to get into the office market, and that began to um, both fuel our growth as a firm, getting up to 40, 50, 60 people, but also um, began to expand our abilities. 
beyond small scale projects to, to much larger, complicated work. And and what what was the the kind of the 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 thing that kind of changed some of the the leadership at the practice? Mm -hmm. So obviously you you were kind of coming into a business that already had a good forty years of of mm -hmm. life or fifty years even. Um, what what were the what were these leadership transitions like? Well, one of the one of the things that uh, I have to give uh, Ed Jeter and Dave Jepson a lot of credit for is that they they looked very far ahead in terms of leadership transition, and and that's something that you have to do because the the transition of a firm to be successful could take five to ten years in terms of, mm -hmm. of thinking about that next generation of leaders and how do you grow them. So they began really in the in the mid to late '80s to think about what would happen when the the two of them, who were the only owners at the time, um, it was a very traditional uh, S corp uh, where you had two uh, two principals who owned all the all the stock in the company, um, and uh, they they then began to think about well, what's next? Um, what was their exit strategy going to be when they still had over ten years or more in Dave's case that they wanted to practice? Um, what happened was they began to create new principals. They had never there had never been more than two principals in the firm really dating all the way back to 1936 when it was Jeter and Cook when there were two two partners again very traditional practice mm -hmm. kind of a small scale so as um, they engaged with a number of consultants uh, over the years to to find out best practices how do you how do you go about transitioning and in the late 80s and early 90s they began to divest some stock and, and while we were still an S corp they brought in really what was the third generation of ownership, still in a very traditional sense. Um, it, it was um, people buying in, right? So it was it was going to a bank, getting a mm -hmm. loan, purchasing your stock, and and really having a, a financial stake in the success of the company. And that process um, brought in, I believe, initially three additional principals, and then there was another round in the mid '90s, mid to late '90s, when I was a part of that that right. transition when I became a principal and, and uh, became a, a shareholder in the company. And that that went on through the early part of the 2000s. And eventually we were at about, I think, 12, 12 to 14 shareholders in the mm -hmm. in the firm. And we had grown to over 100, actually up to about 150 people in the early 2000s. Um, and so we were, we were getting what, large. What was that like for you, you personally? Because I think it's quite interesting um, and it's and it's a little bit different now as well how people often end up you know having ownership in an architecture firm and I think it's quite important for certainly like a younger generation to to understand what current partners did or the risks mm -hmm. that you took in order to buy sure. into the practice. What what did that look like for you personally? What sorts of things did you have to deal with, and what were your what were your concerns? It was an enormous risk. It was really a leap of faith, and, and that was, in some ways, the old way of buying into a firm. It literally involved going to a bank and, and taking out a, a personal loan. Mm -hmm. um, in, in my case, uh, I was fortunate I didn't, didn't have to put my house up as collateral, but some people, mm -hmm. some people did, um, but I had to get an unsecured loan from a bank. Yeah. Um, and uh, pay the loan back every month. It was uh, it was a real investment of real money, and uh, that made it um, that made it a risk because at any point, if the firm was not successful enough to provide income to both mm -hmm. repay the loan and make it a good investment, um, yeah, you would you you were in potential financial peril. So there was a very real downside risk to to being a principal back mm -hmm. uh, back in that under that form of ownership and, and many firms still have that obviously smaller firms sure uh, and I do talk to our younger staff about that 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 is uh, the price of of moving into a leadership position no longer and we can talk about that but in the old uh, you know in, in a more traditional practice yeah if, uh, if the firm had a bad year then we would be ex we never did thankfully but we would have been expected to um, take a, pay have a cash reserve and and put money into the business to keep it going yeah. yeah um um how did your attitude change when you when you put you know your own cash on the line basically when you got when you got skin in the game yeah if you like. yeah, yeah we, we use that phrase a lot <laughs> when we used to meet um i don't i don't know 
I don't know that it changed significantly other than practice became much more serious. Um, mm -hmm. You became uh, much more aware of, I think, um, doing the extra. Um, although I, I would argue that anybody who moves into a leadership role in a firm has already sort of committed to that firm, at least ideally. And they're, yeah. they're already going the extra mile and doing whatever needs to be done to get to get projects out the door. And that's always kind of been our ethos in the firm is that our, our principles have always been uh, heavily immersed in the practice. We don't have any principles who don't who don't work with clients, who don't lead project teams, who don't do marketing, um, who don't move furniture around the office if that's what's needed. I mean, that's, you know, we just pitch in and do whatever. Uh, that was always the the ethos of the firm and, and remains that. So, so there was a, there was a certainly a seriousness that came with it, um, mm -hmm. but also a sense of responsibility, I think more than anything else, understanding that you were now responsible for the business going forward and that, everyone that worked um, as a collaborator within the firm also had families and people who relied on them. And there was a real, uh, real responsibility to maintain the business and, and make sure that it was sustainable financially, yeah. uh, but also was providing uh, culturally the kind of place people wanted to come to work every day with the, the kind of atmosphere. Um, I think it, it would be very easy um, to fall into the trap of, of focusing on the money Mm -hmm. Once you have skin in the game, but that's very short-sighted because if yeah. you're not doing great work and you don't have people who want to come to work and enjoy each other's company, and if the culture isn't robust, well, then you're not going to do very well and, and you're going to end up in a financial problem. So um, we really had to stay focused on on the mm -hmm. other things and, and keep an eye on the money and spend appropriately and stay within our means, which is another hallmark of the firm. We've always... Uh, been kind of debt free and and made, sort of paid our way um, and been very cautious about that, but not at the expense of of staff or or the work. Yeah, what makes a good partner in a business like JCJ? What 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 things are you looking for? And it, because I mean, I think again, this is interesting because because we often place partnership as the pinnacle of a, mm -hmm. of a career. I'm not entirely sure that it always is because it's not for everybody, right? No, it's not. It's not. We've certainly had people that we've we've thought might aspire to be a partner, and they've mm -hmm. they've really not been interested. They're very happy to be leading project teams. Um, I do yeah. I do think most of our most of our senior staff, are the ones who maybe don't aspire to being a principal in the firm absolutely aspire to having some level of control over their projects yeah. and, and, and some level of self-direction. And that's where their, their fulfillment comes from is, is through the work. Mm -hmm. yeah. Got it. And so becoming a partner, what are the skill sets or what are the areas of expertise that a partner's got to be competent, competent in? Well, at least in, in my, in my opinion, my experience, um, a lot of the skills are things that can be, taught and can be acquired as you as you settle into the job i think the things we look for as we're as we're elevating people to the principal level are, are really character traits so it's um you know at baseline you've got to you've got to know the business right you've, i mean the business of design you've got to you've got to be passionate about architecture and practice and, and really love what we do for a living and and be interested so we also look for curiosity um, people who are interested in learning new things. Uh, anyone who thinks they've they know it all mm -hmm. is probably not going to be a good a good candidate to be a principal in a firm. They're, they're, you, you need to be looking ahead and as curious as the junior staff are and what what the next thing is, both in practice and design and technology. Um, and then we look for judgment. You know, we look for a course of of thoughtful uh, conversation, of thoughtful judgment. Um, can you exercise that? that sort of mystical skill of being able to balance all the myriad things we balance of art and design and practice and, and culture and, and find that kind of sweet spot, that middle ground where um, we have people who are happy. We have buildings that are, that are great. We have projects that are on budget. I mean, that's, it's a, it's a major balancing act. And ultimately sure. it's, it's that sense of leadership and judgment that we're mm -hmm. looking for. Um, can you inspire other people? Can, will people follow you? Um, or, or not. And if, the, if, if you're not someone who 
has some of those innate gifts, uh, probably not going to rise to to the level of principle. Yeah. How, how important is bringing in work? Do all partners have a responsibility to 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 win the work and to mm-hmm. negotiate and ensure that the fees are on the money, yeah. or or do you have some partners who don't do any winning work activities and are more focused inside of the operations and projects? Well, we all have periods when we're not winning work, and that's that's never fun. But but the reality is that is that is a baseline responsibility, and right. and you know just referencing back to the last question, that's something we look for as well. Are people who are interested, or who have mm-hmm. participated? Um, you know, bringing in work is really something that all of our staff are engaged in, and we encourage, right. and and it's it's one of those things that. As people grow through the profession, we like to engage them in that whole process of, of the pursuit and the winning of new work because it does train leadership. Um, but yeah, uh, we are um, what we call the seller doer model. So mm-hmm. we don't have uh, we have support staff for marketing and business development, but the leadership are really all the principals and senior leaders of the firm, senior associates, associate mm-hmm. principals, and principals. We all have goals every year for. Um, for revenue that we we want to win, yeah. um, and um, and we all have sectors that we we are more engaged in, so we sort of divide and conquer in the various business areas that we we practice. But everybody's involved, and everybody is always uh, networking, engaged, and part of the I wouldn't say part of, but leading the efforts really in terms of of putting together proposals and interviews and and really pitching new work. That's that's a baseline. Mm-hmm. And sometimes, sometimes that's a barrier to entry for some people sure. um, who, who just like, nope, I'm really not interested in doing that. And that, that sometimes is, is something that keeps staff from wanting to rise mm-hmm. to the principal level. It's just so, a, too big a step. So, so, so what are the sorts of strategies that the partners employ in order to, to win work above and beyond obviously doing fantastic work and mm-hmm. allowing that natural process of completing mm-hmm. a project and, and accumulating referrals that come from doing good quality work? Mm-hmm. What, what do the partners do above and beyond that? I think the, the, the key thing we do is we're always in, focused on what the, the needs are of the potential client. Mm-hmm. So when we, when we approach approach uh, a client that, I mean, happily, we get a lot of repeat work. That's, a, a, I think, over well over half of our of our work is repeat work, and that's the least expensive marketing we can do. But when yeah. we do have to pitch new work, and because so much of our work is public sector work, that's inevitable. Even if it's mm-hmm. an existing client, there are procurement laws that require they, they go back out. Um, we're always looking sort of behind the curtain with the client, trying to understand what their needs are, what their how can we be of service is, is really what it comes down to. And when we put together a proposal or we focus an interview and we try to, we try to have a message, it's always a message that focuses on what the benefit will be to the client. It's never about us and it shouldn't be. It's not about our work. It's not about awards we've won. Uh, it's about how we can be a good design partner and, and a good partner to help guide them through the process and, and get them to the place they need to be. Mm-hmm. Um, we're you know we very much want to focus on their needs and I, and I think that 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 kind of focus and when we do it well that's when we win the work and and when we don't win the work when we when we take a good look at a debrief sort of post action of why we may not have won inevitably yeah. somewhere in there we talked about us too much and them yeah. too little and and that that can be deadly and people sense that right away they see it do, do you sit down strategically as a partnership group and kind of identify sectors that you want to be doing more work in and then mm-hmm. identify kind of key players in those industries and then kind of reverse engineer how you might get into contact and how you might mm-hmm. be able to serve their, their needs? Absolutely. We, we both uh, we, we sit as, as leadership groups and, and it's not just principals. We, we involve staff up and down. Um, mm-hmm. The practice, because everybody knows somebody or has something to contribute. So we we encourage, we meet monthly uh, as as groups to to talk about both our existing practice areas and how we might expand those or change those, because those are constantly evolving. We want to make sure we're following wherever those markets are, and then uh, pretty much annually we sit down and begin to think through: Are there other areas uh, that we might want to move into? What would be necessary? 
sometimes to move into a new practice area, what's necessary may be a, an acquisition of a firm with a portfolio right. in that market sector. Um, one of the things I've seen over the last 30 some years of practice is it's increasingly difficult to break into a new area of practice that you're not into. Yeah. Most clients now, one of the minimums of a, of a request for services would be, have you done 10 other projects exactly like ours in our neighborhood? And if you mm -hmm. haven't, they often don't want to even <laughs> talk to you. I mean, exaggerating, but not that much. Um, often it feels <laughs> that way. And so if you don't have any work in, in a particular area, uh, you can partner with another firm, which we do a lot to, to yeah. bring expertise. And sometimes that leads us into a, a new area of business um, mm -hmm. or, or you, you can hire uh, strategic hires, people that you bring in at a senior level who have expertise or you can acquire a firm. Those are sort of your, your mm -hmm. paths to entry. It is almost impossible anymore to just show up and say, trust us. You know, yeah. We've done a lot of projects similar to yours. And, and and we'll be good at it because um, inevitably there'll be five other firms that have done projects just like theirs. And yeah. And while they may like you, they're not willing to take that risk. And, and I really can't blame them, especially if it's a public client and, and they're going to be in the newspaper about hiring an inexperienced firm. I, you know, we sort of get that. Yeah. Well, it, it's interesting actually to consider like from the client's perspective, is this method of procurement intelligent or is it actually very constraining i mean we're, we're no longer in the era of say in the in the 70s where say here in in well in in europe where you had someone like renzo piano and richard rogers winning who never built anything really mm -hmm. winning something like the pompidou center and building sure. a major you know mm -hmm. multi-million pound art gallery in the center of a major city yeah. Um, do, do you think clients are shooting themselves in the foot here with, with kind of being overly risk averse? Or is it something that architects that we've missed as an industry that we've allowed the procurement process to be so sort of demanding and kind of risk averse? Well, when we first get into the profession, I think every young architect dreams of winning that big competition and, you know, building uh, Boston City Hall or the Pompidou Center and breaking in. But it, it that doesn't much happen anymore. I mean, there's yeah. few and far between that, that and even the competitions are, are hard. Um, and we do a few competitions, but we don't do that many just because mm -hmm. it's, it's not a, it's just not something we're set up for. Um, I don't, I don't know that clients are always doing themselves um, a service. Now, now many of these, because they're public are set by procurement laws and there's not a lot you can do, although they could open up the lens a little bit um, and be less risk averse and, and more willing to, um, to find out whether or not a client uh, and, a, and an architect are, are a good fit. Mm -hmm. I would say our, our best interviews, the ones I've been in that are the best ever, have been this. They've been a conversation where they'll say, don't bring any boards. Don't bring a slide deck. We just want to talk to you. And mm -hmm. uh, we've won some work that way. In fact, we're usually very successful. Mm -hmm. um, and and um, so years, well, in 2001, I remember because we were actually – prepping on 9-11 for this particular interview. So it was, it was in September of 2001. We were shortlisted to do the Center for Film Studies at Wesleyan University here in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. We had never done a Center for Film Studies, a film building, anything even remotely close. We had made the shortlist through some relationships we had on campus. And the interview was in a living room. And it was with the director of the program and a, and a handful of people with no boards, just us. Just let, they just wanted to talk to us, and we went in, we sat down, and the director of the program and I just hit it off. Um, there was a connection. We started. We had this great conversation around uh, film and architecture, and manipulating light, and how those two things really had more in common than one might think. The production of a film, the production of a building, mm -hmm. and there were so many similarities. We didn't really talk about their project. We talked about other things, and there was a chemistry and a connection. And I think a level of trust, and we ultimately got the project, which mm -hmm. then turned into a 20-year relationship with three different wow. phases. And it, it was uh, it was it was remarkable, and a process I wish more clients would use. But typically, it's it's really much more of a dog and pony show, and um, and I don't know how much we as architects can can actually change that. It uh, it, it really is a, a challenge because so much of it is set by mm -hmm. by regulation and procurement offices. Private clients have more. Ability yeah, to do that. 
well, this is where it's interesting, you know, with, with, with private clients, you know, be they commercial or residential, there's a lot more kind of, um, you know, versatility or there's more of a mm-hmm. breadth of ways of approaching them and negotiating and, and yeah. creating new services. When you're dealing with schools and institutions, you know, often many times somebody has sat down with a, with a financial guy and a legal guy or girl and worked out what the brief is and then they've got a little hole for the architect to fit into and now you're kind of pitching for that work and you know there's there's infinite amount of issues with that certainly from the architect's perspective and sometimes you're not even able to ask questions of the of the prospective client which then kind of shuts down a dialogue which is actually very important for for the beginnings of the design design phase and it's you know it becomes you know how do we how do we na- navigate around that yeah, if I, if I contrast um, the the process I just talked about with what is the more typical process, you're exactly right. We we often uh, well we almost exclusively get no contact with the actual user group or the client pre-interview mm-hmm. by law, often in in public procurement or or even mm-hmm. in larger institutions that have systems, large colleges and universities that have um, procedures procedures in place. Then we're asked to come into an interview situation and present some kind of design idea because everyone expects that in a, in a complete vacuum. And while we always have a, a disclaimer and a preface at the beginning that we've designed this in a complete vacuum based on what you've told us in the brief, what we've found about you online, what we're able to, to gain through site visits, it, it is not um, not unusual for a firm that simply guesses better about yeah. what the client's looking for to be selected because people fall in love with images and with with design work and it and it's um I do think they do themselves a disservice when when that happens and and it puts us in a in a very funny position of trying to design something for a client that we've never met and it it's um it's not even as it's not even as thorough as a competition brief might be where where there's mm-hmm. an expectation that um that you're giving a, information we're often working on little to no information about the client other than the site. Mm-hmm. Sometimes we don't even have a program because that's part of the brief is to develop the program. So you're even guessing at the size of the building, the, the disposition of the spaces, and it becomes a, a – we've lost projects where they said, well, you know, we really liked this other one better because it had a pitched roof and you showed us a, a round roof. And so, well, we, we do pitched roofs too, but okay. Uh, it's been that simple, and, and I, that seems like a, yeah. a rather shallow way to select – someone you're going to have a relationship with for five mm-hmm. to six years during a building project. How would you suggest or recommend to clients to improve their procurement process and selection process of an architect? I, I think you need to spend more time at it. Um, often it's it's rushed. Um, it's mm-hmm. very form-driven. Um, I, I think the interview process needs to be more of a conversation mm-hmm. uh, and, and based on, I think, on questions around um, approach to work about process uh, about um, kind of a thoughtful investigation of how are you how are you going to guide us through this process and not so much about a commodity but about a relationship because I think very often the focus ends up on the end the end product which of course is a building or or an environment of some kind when really what you're hiring is is a partner and you need to focus on those things that you would look for in any any relationship you know are we going to be able to work together uh, do we have a are we of like minds or is this going to be a are we going to have a hard time communicating are we going to have a hard time um, you, you understanding where I where I am or where I'm coming from the kinds of things that we value and I really think the more successful client relationships we've had have started with interviews and conversations that are deeper than than a design idea uh, maybe yeah. maybe a design or a sketch is a vehicle to understand how people think, but mm-hmm. it should only be viewed as that, and and that's often a hard a hard thing for people to do. Yeah, absolutely. How do you prepare the the kind of younger generation of leaders for kind of dealing with and navigating kind of ever ever more challenging procurement processes and you know and and winning work? Mm-hmm. challenges if you like sure uh, well we we do it in part by just involving them uh, so mm-hmm. we we don't um we don't shy away from sharing um we we're a very transparent organization so we share 
uh, every month at a, at a firm-wide meeting, the work we're going after, the work we've won, the work we've we've lost, um, sometimes why we've won, why we've lost, so that people understand that work doesn't magically just drop out of the sky. Um, you know, we're not uh, we're not we're not flying back to the nest and just dropping food in. You know, that this is a, we're all out there together, going after it. And I think I think that helps as mm-hmm. people begin to understand that there is a whole process. Um, we involve them uh, in when, so when we get a, a request for proposal, the first thing we do is we have a go, no go meeting. And that is, that involves a wide group of people beyond principals, um, folks who are active in that particular area. So if it's a K-12 project, there's a, a wide group of, of folks, um, designers, young architects, principals, associate principals, interior designers. We have a large interior design practice um, that all get on the call and we talk it through and we score it with a with a rubric we have that's not a be all end all but it's been very helpful to give it a, a score and we look at we look at all the things that might make this a good project for us is it is there a design challenge is there a fee that we can make money um, is it wired for some other firm do we think do we have a relationship um, have we ever worked for this client in this area on this project type? I mean, a lot of it's fairly straightforward, but it, it helps us at least set up um, set up a, 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 a number, and then we have a conversation around that. So by having junior staff part of that conversation, they really kind of see that this isn't arbitrary, that we're not going after projects because some principal thinks it would be fun to do. Um, and that's something we've evolved from. I would say there was a time that is how we chased work. Was oh yeah let's I want to go after that so because Jim says we're going after it we're going to go after it um, now it's a it's a group decision and right. uh, and and we do offer leadership but but we 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 go after far less projects than than we could uh, because mm-hmm. we want to make sure that we're going to be successful and that if we win it it'll be a good fit and it'll be a good project for our staff for our portfolio for our business it's uh, it's not enough just to just to win a project and then have five years of misery and and <laughs> and, and a non-profit. I mean, it's just, you know, it's just, it's it's not worth it for us. We've done it, yeah. and uh, and we've learned. So so the staff are involved there, and then once the team's put together, the entire team is involved in the written response. So we'll we'll parcel it out. Folks will will help fill out the forms if needed. Under the you know the marketing department runs it, but they go to the staff for for writing. We ask people to write. Um, we ask them to update their resume. So we, we involve them beginning at you know, sort of very low-level tasks that just get them in it, get them in the conversation. And then ultimately, they'll be prepping um, for an interview, right? So they'll be, if we shortlist, uh, there'll be many people in the interview presentation. They'll be part of the of the storyboarding of an interview. We'll, we'll involve them in the conversation around what our message should be. What do we know? But they'll be doing research on the client. And it really is a group effort because there's no way to do this with individuals and and uh, just by yourself. So there'll be a group effort to prepare for the interview. We rehearse, we we talk it through, and then we involve junior staff in the interviews uh, to the level that they may be comfortable, mm-hmm. um, and and maybe to push them a little bit as well because we we need people to become comfortable with public speaking, with presentation, with being um, sort of nimble on their feet and able to sure. answer questions. And and the only way you can learn that is to do that and, yes, and we try that in. yeah i mean we don't push people into the deep end without without you know uh, any lifeguard you know i'll be there to to guide but we we let people go as far as they can and then try to push them a little further and and reassure them that they they can do it um you know we try to build people up and give them the support they need and, and if they need extra rehearsal or extra tips um you know we'll do we'll do what we need to do to get people ready for that because ultimately if they're going to take over in leadership they need they need to be the folks doing the mentoring instead of being the mentees yeah is that a word mentee i think it is i don't know yeah okay (laughs) employee mentee all right i think it works um you you mentioned another really interesting strategy of entering into sectors is actually acquisition or or merging Mm -hmm. with another another firm and i i I enjoy this subject greatly Mm -hmm. 
um and it's you know there's there's a lot of intricacy in it there's a lot of complexity mm -hmm. actually with like number one identifying a firm that you want to acquire the valuation mm -hmm. process um and then of course the kind of culture fit mm -hmm. which which is probably the more complex aspect of all of this and dealing mm -hmm. with emotions and people now working under a different set of processes mm -hmm. and systems can you walk us through how um how you guys do that how do you i how do you identify the right firm to either acquire or merge what kind of consultants do you work with and what what are some of the challenges with with the, the acquisition of other businesses sure yeah we we have um a number of consultants that are um, uh, brokers and represent firms looking to sell that, that we're in touch with mm -hmm. um, a few over the years that we've, we've developed relationships with and they, they, they know, we let them know if there's a particular profile we're looking for. And, and generally mm -hmm. what we're looking for is either a geographic area um, that we would like to move into or think we should move into or, mm -hmm. or a, a, a particular, um, portfolio of work that we that we don't have so and we've done both we've done mm -hmm. both kinds of acquisitions our san diego office um was an acquisition of a firm called wheeler weimer blackman that had been a, a 50 year old firm in san diego when we we ultimately merged with them in 2005 and that was a geographic um primarily geographic was the, was the reason for that we wanted we needed a, a practice on the west coast that was really our first our first um, remote office but that was a process um, that happened and, and this this has happened with both of our uh, most with that acquisition and our most recent one these were firms that we partnered with before so uh, oddly enough neither of them came through the broker to the brokers, mm -hmm. these were these were organic relationships that, right? For, okay. For very yeah, for various reasons, we had partnered with them to do project work, and then they had been st then strategically partnered over a period of time. So, in the case of Wheeler Weimer Blackman, we had uh, teamed with them in 1998, I think it was, to pursue a Native American casino in California. We had been put together as a team by a, a construction manager who thought we would be a good fit. Um, did not get that work. But about a year later, San Diego Unified School District had a, a billion, $2 billion bond for K-12 work. Uh, Wheeler Weimer Blackman had done some small school work, but nothing like our, what at that point then was our national portfolio in, in K-12 work, mm -hmm. where we had, had received a lot of national recognition. So they called, and, uh, and we teamed with them to go after K-12 work and won several projects in our first interview together. And then... Then we won some additional hospitality work, and we worked together, mm -hmm. including having our people in their office in San Diego for about five years. Right. Okay. Um, so, the, so yeah. really, the, it was a lot of dating before the marriage. That was exactly how we described it on our <laughs> on our, our rollout night. We had our big party. We did. We dated and and lived in sin for about five years, and then <laughs> and then we uh, and then and then we got then we got married. Uh, and but through that time, there was plenty of time to get to know each other culturally to understand uh, how we'd work together. We had worked in each other's processes. So in some ways, that's an ideal. It's, that's not yeah. always the case, but that, that's ideal when that works. Uh, and that's been very successful. Um, and that was about, about geography. More recently, um, we now have a Group 1 in Boston, a Group 1 studio. Similarly, we've been working with them for a number of years on hospitality projects. Um, they're, they're a well-known um, hospitality firm based in Boston. And they do hospitality work, had done hospitality work different than ours. Ours had been primarily uh, focused on uh, casinos, uh, Native American hospitality, and not so much corporate um, major flags, whereas they had a long relationship with more corporate hospitality hotel clients. And that was something we had tried for a number of years to to break into mm -hmm. with some success. But, but um, again, when you try to do something organically, it can it can just take time. So we had been working with them um, both in pursuit of projects, but also just sharing staff. We had a good relationship, a really good um, connection uh, with their principals. And just this past spring, we, we consummated a deal after, again, about three or four years of dating. Mm -hmm. um, it, we started talking to them before the pandemic, and then the pandemic just sort of put everything on hold. Um, we continued to work together, and we, we um, announced our uh, – and, and closed on our, our merger with them back in, I think it was May. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that has now broadened our hospitality portfolio in 
to a, a whole other uh, area, which is is corporate hotels for some of the major chains, and uh, in in across the country. So that's been uh, very beneficial to us, and and the it also gave us a, a larger staff in Boston. Our Boston office right. has always been about. 10 to 12, 15 people. We're now up to 30, which gives us a critical mass that that our institutional clients appreciate because they're always looking for um, a firm, especially Boston. Boston is a very kind of insular, parochial. This may be something we need to edit out later, but I, <laughs> but I think they would admit that too. If you if you're not in Boston, they don't very often institutions of Boston are are reluctant to work. Sure. So it helps us to get work in in the Boston area to have a larger a larger practice there. So it's been kind of a win on, on both sides for, for us. What are some of the, the, the technical aspects to making an acquisition? For example, the, the kind of conversation around valuations and actually, you know, how much are you going to pay for the business? How does the, how does the valuation actually work? How is, how are they, is it described? Is it a case of you have your own independent valuation and they have their own um, valuation and you kind of come together and see who's, mm -hmm. who's meet in the middle yeah, that's exactly how it works. Um, it's like any other uh, any other negotiation or any other purchase. I think we uh, we have evaluations. They have evaluations. Sometimes there are, we've had a few um, acquisitions we've looked at where we couldn't uh, make it work out um, for various reasons. We couldn't come to a meeting of the minds on what the value was. Um, we look at um, so so in terms of the actual value, that's exactly how it works. We 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 look at valuation. We look at work in progress. We look at backlog uh, liability. Um, you know, with, mm -hmm. a, with an architecture practice, there's a lot of due diligence. Uh, so what we've done more recently is, as we've gotten, uh, you know, every, you learn every time you do this. And and our most recent acquisition, we put a team, an internal team together, of all of our uh, directors of various departments, IT, HR, finance, uh, marketing, and uh, went through a due diligence checklist. So they sort of dug into what the other firm was doing, had conversations with their counterparts and, and really began to understand, you know, are there any any skeletons in the closet? Are there are there practices that scare us or there, you know, um, and, and shared our information with them because it's a two way street. We need to make sure they need to be sure that if they're if they're being acquired that their staff are going to be happy, that their business is going to thrive and no one no one wants to well, very few firms want to be absorbed by uh, a larger firm and then disappear. They want some some sense that there's there's got to be value in it for more than just the partners who are who are selling. There's got to be value to the staff in terms of new work, better benefits, different office. Um, yeah. Often, often what we can offer to a smaller firm, or, or certainly the staff, to, or is a better benefits package because of yeah. our size. And a broader capability of of, uh, of work. So, in the case of of Group One, their staff, some of their staff, have been interested in moving out of hospitality and trying some community based work, whether it's a school project or a boys and girls club or or some other cultural project. It gives them more opportunity. So we, we look at that. But yeah, the valuation is it's it's down to the numbers. I mean, the, we have our accountants and our lawyers, mm -hmm. and their accountants and their lawyers, and then we just go back and forth till we arrive at. At, a, at what we think a fair value is, and then also looking at um, is there is there an earnout period? Is it cash up front? Is there going to be a period of time where, the, where we expect the principals to work and right. hit certain targets, so that we're assured that there's some value down the road to the acquisition, so that there's some skin in the game for them for a, at least a couple of years till we get established. Yeah, and I, and I, I guess because that's that's quite a risk if you're acquiring a firm mm -hmm. and. Whilst the firm name has got experience, it's actually the relationships with the individual principles that mm -hmm. that they have of those. And if they suddenly disappear, then how can we be certain that yeah, you've got what you wanted? Right. We haven't bought much, if if that's it. I mean, really, that's what you're purchasing. Um, yeah, the the desks and the computers aren't really worth a whole heck of a lot. It's it's the people um, yeah. and the relationships that are that you're that you're. Acquire, you're not acquiring people. You're acquiring relationships and bringing them into the into the fold. And there needs to be a mechanism. And, and often this is the sticking point: um, is what the, you know, how much deferred compensation there may be, what the buyout looks like. Are people willing to to take that on as a challenge? And I think that often tells us something about the motivation of the sellers as well. Um, 
we've been approached over the years by firms looking to be acquired. And you don't have to scratch very far to realize that really it's it's a firm that maybe waited too long to think about their transition, and now now the the owners are looking trying to make a buck. For, yeah, they're they're just they're looking for a soft landing. They want to get out as quickly as they can. But without them, if there's not a, we're always looking. We always look at the next level of of their team, and if they don't have a strong leadership team below them that that would step in right after they leave then that doesn't look like a good deal to us because we do mm-hmm. need we do need the team in place for three four five years after an acquisition to really fully integrate the practices fully integrate the projects under you know fully integrate the clients where they they really feel like they're now a jcj client and not a client of the former firm so it, it's a it's a time and people intensive process you can't yeah. overlook the people side of it absolutely I, I'm, I, I think that kind of segues nicely into perhaps uh, quite a significant acquisition, which is of your own firm by <laughs> your own your own employees. Um, can you tell us a little bit about about that process? What, why, what led you to becoming an ESOP? What have been some of the advantages, mm-hmm. um, and what sure. have been some of the challenges? Yeah, yeah. Actually, I hadn't really thought about it, but it is the largest acquisition we've ever had. Was our when we acquired ourselves um, as as employees? Yeah, that's I, I love that. Um, well, we you know we we talked way back at the beginning of of our our conversation around uh, Ed Jeter and Dave Jepson and their transition. So they ultimately transitioned over to I think it was I think it was fourteen of us. I'll get the number right. Um, uh, Ed Jeter retired around two thousand. Dave Jepson wanted to retire. Uh, around 2012, and we needed to then, and that left a group of us um, that were all within about a 10-year age range. You know, we were all in our 50s, um, and I happened to be on the younger end of that. I still was not a young architect anymore, um, and we had to start thinking about what our next generation would look like, and we needed to look 10 years, 10 or so years down the road. And when we looked at what the, by that time, the firm uh, was quite valuable, the share value, our own share values were, were quite high um, and were going to be higher. We didn't really have enough staff when we really looked at it that could sort of buy into the firm in the traditional way. We just, um, you know, over over time, the shares just became uh, somewhat unaffordable to, to most staff and it would be a very right. a challenge. I would also say to, you know, again, to some of our earlier conversation, it's a different time, and the idea of going to a bank and getting a loan um, was really not of interest to most most people, mm-hmm. even if they were interested in being a principal. They there was a, a whole different methodology of, of maybe bonusing it in, and so we we worked with uh, our lawyers and and a few consultants uh, and looked at I want to say six, seven, eight different possible methods of transitioning the firm. It took a good year to eighteen months of principals meeting talking uh, before we, we really landed on the ESOP. And it wasn't our first, it wasn't our immediate thought, but the more we learned about it, the more it, it seemed to make a lot of sense. Um, it, it allowed a mechanism for those of us who were shareholders to to sell our shares uh, over a period of time. You know, so the, the, there was a note, uh, it was, I think there was an eight-year, I think it was an eight-year note um, broken into two two pieces where the firm, um, we held notes and the firm paid us each year, um, which which meant that it was affordable because it was the firm purchasing uh, purchasing our shares. It also, we also all had um, uh, agreements with the firm. So there were, you know, we were, it wasn't like we could take our money and leave. We had to, you know, we had to earn it and work and continue to build the firm so that we were building value over a period of, uh, between five and eight years, there was some different people were allowed to 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 take different uh, different deals depending on their level of of ownership. So there was a it made it a much more um, gradual transition of leadership. Whereas people retired um, and were paid off, um, the debt got paid down, and the ESOP shares increased in value. So we became an ESOP, 100% ESOP, in 2012. So we just passed our our 10-year mark, and we're now officially, the government calls us a mature ESOP, which comes with some different different rules, some different regulations and opportunities. But what it's done, um, and it took some time, is that it has given every every member of the staff um, real 
um, a real financial stake in the company. So the, well, I think one of the misunderstandings about an ESOP is that it's somehow a, a, we all vote on everything. The, the leadership of the firm has stayed the same. We still yeah. have the same leadership structure, the same principals, directors, uh, C-suite officers. That has all stayed the same. It, what the ESOP really is is a, is a uh, is a retirement plan where you have a, you're invested in a single share in a single company, but you have a lot of control over how that company does and a lot of of Im- impact on your share value. So the shares started pretty low because we had a lot of debt. As the debt got paid down and the firm did better, we have an annual valuation, and the share value has continued to increase from from year one. And is uh, we just got our staff just got their valuations last week. And mm-hmm. the new share values, and it has grown significantly. And, and at this point, um, I think everyone has a that's been here over five years and is vested has a fairly significant nest egg that they can mm-hmm. now continue to grow. And it uh, and people, it took a while, but once people began to see their balance sheet grow in in their ESOP account and understood that the work that there was a connection between their work their attitude and, and their ESOP shares, it really began to, to take hold. I think the first couple of years, there was a lot of skepticism because nothing really changed. You know, there was no value in your, in your shares, not much. Yeah. But even, even through the, um, even through the pandemic, um, share value grew um, because we were able to, we were able to, to make it through the pandemic in a, in a, in a successful way. So it's it, it's good financially, but I'd say even more so what's happened as the, as the ESOP has gained hold is it's just been a natural extension of our culture. Uh, mm-hmm. We've talked before about how we try to involve everyone. We're very transparent. This this made us even more transparent. So we share financials every month. We share uh, key performance indices every month. Uh, the staff know a lot about what's going on, good and bad. Um, and and we have uh, I think greater a sense of ownership and and an ability to to in, impact change. So we've always we've always tried to feel a bit like a big family, and we we get that a lot when we do do employee surveys. Some of the positives that come back are always that there's this um, sense that everybody cares about each other across the firm, and uh, and that's something that we feel really good about. Um, and, and I think the ESOP is a natural extension of that. It's just everybody, everybody's in this together. It's not, it's not people working for a group of principals who are taking all the money out of the business. Everybody at this point um, is getting is getting um, rewarded financially long term for their investment in the business. And, mm-hmm. and I think that's that's a great thing. And people are are beginning to really embrace that. We have uh, we have an ESOP committee which are employees who have t- really kind of taken ownership of the messaging around ESOP and they, they share uh, tips and tricks. They understand, you know, they, they do events to, to try to build culture, but they also answer all the questions people have about what does this mean? And, you know, they, they orient new staff to what, what it means to be a member of an ESOP. And it's been, uh, it's been great. I, I think that's fantastic. And it's uh particularly in this day and age as well, where perhaps home ownership is not the, primary way of developing mm-hmm. wealth anymore or perhaps it's you know it's very difficult to kind of enter into that that actually developing and creating wealth through the investment of the business that you're working and participating in mm-hmm. is you know is, is is very empowering and kind of just gives a you know a, a, a different level of, of freedom mm-hmm. for for team members yeah um, i think yeah, i think especially for younger staff who may not be in the housing market it, it, mm-hmm. it's a great way to begin to build their wealth yeah, awesome. Brilliant. I think that's the a, a perfect place to conclude the conversation there, Jim. Thank you so much uh, well, thank for, you. for your expertise. Thoroughly enjoyed that. We've uh, really got a good a good coverage there. So um, great. You know, and, and thank you so much again. And uh, I look forward to speaking to you again. Thank you. I, I enjoyed this very much. I'd love to talk to you again. Thank you. And that's a wrap. And one more thing. If you haven't already, please do head on over to iTunes or Spotify and leave us a review. We'd love to read your name out here on the show and we'd love to get your feedback and we'd love to hear what it is that you'd like to see more of and what you love about the show already. Have you ever been frustrated with architectural photographers who aren't reliable or don't capture your projects the way that you'd hoped? Visit TobinDavies.com or BOAPhotos.com 
to book renowned architectural photographer Tobin Davies to photograph your next project. Tobin Davies travels to your location and specializes in architectural photography for modern, design-focused architecture. Again, visit TobinDavies.com or BOAPhotos.com to get more information or book your shoot today. And tell them you heard about him here on the podcast for a complimentary package upgrade. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond, or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.